And I am really pleased to have Marcus O'Rourke with us to talk about dish receivers, dish maintenance. And are you also going to talk a little bit about the uh, contest they were telling me about? Yes, I can. And I will. Good. Marcus, welcome to our little get together. Hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, kind of unexpected to be here today, but you know what? We'll make the best of it. Uh, so dish maintenance, it is that time of year where, you know, well, I guess some of us have already had a lot of snow and ice and everything like that, but it's always a, a good topic to have in mind is dish maintenance and making sure that your antennas are ready to handle what's coming up with your spring storms, with the winter, and just general checkups. Obviously, the first thing you, you kind of want to make sure is that your antenna is there. Uh, let me share. I think it's going to be this one. The other thing to look at is to make sure that your antenna is actually pointing in the right direction. I will not say where I found this antenna, but it is definitely not pointing in the right direction. Uh, sometimes wind will kick in and the antenna just eventually just loosens up and then that one gust comes in and whoosh, flips it around. So making sure your bolts are tight, making sure that your antenna is peaked there is actually a way that you can... So as the satellite, let me... Uh... Peaking your, your antenna is important to do it at a very specific time. I'm, and I'm not sure that everybody is quite aware of, of what the center of box is. And as you're looking south over the equator, your satellite, your geostationary satellite, not quite geostationary, is inside of a box and it kind of floats inside this little box. And when you are aiming your antenna, you want to kind of aim for that center part of that box. So that way, if the satellite's on the edge, you're still good. If it's on the other edge, you're still good. And so going online to, say, SES is one of the satellite providers, and typing in center of box will give you a list of times and dates of when that satellite will be in the middle. Peaking it at that time, so that way your you're going to have the best signal available for the whole time that it transits that little box uh, is, is a good idea. So making sure that it's aimed, making sure that it's pointed in the right direction. And um, sometimes it gets dirty. You can use some gentle, gentle, gentle uh, detergent to kind of spray on the, on the dish, on the reflector part of it itself to clean it up. Let's see, do I have another picture of that? No, I don't. Um, having a, because sometimes you'll get kind of like that dark, mildewish looking discoloration. It's not really gonna do much to impact your RF, but sometimes it just looks bad, especially if your dish is in some place where you have it visible to the public. But things that will cause problems are going to be um, on your feed horns. If you have, let me bring up my share screen again. Uh, so this is a picture of a feed assembly on a on a KU uh, downlink. And every once in a while, you'll see at this little cone section. Ooh, ooh, hang on, let me. Okay, I'll just use this little thing. On this little section right here, sometimes it'll have a little cover, kind of like the top of a stoplight will have that little hood. And things like wasps and bees and birds like to build things in their nests. And that will definitely um, cause you to have signal loss. So every once in a while, poking your head around there, taking a look, making sure there's nothing in there. And if there is, uh, gently removing it from in there. And no, it is not. It is not an EMF installation. 
Uh, let's see. Stop share, not that other button I was pushing. Uh, what else? So that feed horn is important. There's also a polarization part to it. That's going to be part of your uh, peaking the dish. Um, trying to, to, to come up with, uh, with what the notes I had earlier that were quickly passed on to me. Oh, if you are in a place where you get weather, like cold weather, like ice, like rain, freezing rain. Come on, where's the other picture? Checking your heaters is important. Sometimes you'll have a heater uh, like this type, just making sure that you have power available to it. You can even turn it on, force it on, just to make sure that it does come on. Uh, there are ways... If you look at the at the bottom of this one specifically, at the bottom of this one specifically, there's a little temperature sensor, and at the top is a moisture sensor. You can put some moist some water at the top and use um, there's a spray that you can get for air conditioning that you can basically lower a, a temperature probe. And I'm blanking on it right now, but freeze that one down. So that way it gets down below that threshold that it needs to turn on. And in this one specifically, this green light starts to flash telling you it's working. It's starting to heat up the dish. So those are things to check if you have... Um, nope, it is the other screen. I have two different picture things up. Uh, if you have a heating element for yours, some of the larger dishes have natural gas. Uh, I found this picture of some banjo burners. One to the left is needing to be cleaned. One to the right is it's clean. Uh, it's refurbished. Uh, making sure that that annual maintenance is done on that as well. It's not a super complex thing. It's not really, you know, there's a whole huge manual about dish maintenance. It's just every once in a while putting eyes on it, making sure things are good, making sure that it's still pointed in the right direction, and just kind of doing some basic cleanup maintenance like you would do with uh, any other outside equipment, if you will. Questions about that? I mean, use ice water. Sorry, I, I missed that part on the chat. So somebody said use ice water. And I'm not sure what we're using ice water for. Oh, for the, got it, for the temperature thing. Yes, that would work too. Questions, comments? Were you thinking of Freon? That is, yes. <laughs> it's just one of those, those things of like, I know it's called something and I'm totally blanking on it. Uh, yes. So it's interesting to talk about uh, uh, orienting the, the focal point to the middle of the box. And what kind of changes would one expect in the, you know, the receiver has, has a number on it. And as that satellite moves around, what kind of range should someone expect? One or two numbers, four or five numbers? Uh, generally, probably a, a DB maybe two at the most, depending on how big the dish is, how how focused the dish is. Um, one to two dB would be uh, expected. And then again, it also depends on um, atmospheric. You know, you might get clouds that pass over and KU band will fade a lot harder than C band will fade. So, Which is why it's important to have, have some uh, extra... Uh, room there for signal loss. Yes, absolutely. Didn't uh, my mind remembering? Wasn't there used to be a phone number you could call that would tell you where the satellite was and when it was expected to be centered in the box? In a long, long time, so maybe it's not there anymore. Maybe. Uh, I know each satellite provider provides their own um, center of box predictions. 
Um, if you like, we are on SES 11, SES 1, and you just type in SES center of box, it'll take you to a link and it'll just say, here you go. I think my memory is going back to before the internet on that. Maybe why. <laughs> and oh, at, um, at ABC, we had uh, 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 regular reports going out to affiliates uh, about solar situations and fading and, and all of that. Probably also included that. Sun outages, yeah, the twice twice a year sun outages. Hmm. Yeah, th those are predicted well well into the future, at least at least a year before. But again, that's a good Google search that will just bring it up, because sometimes these these providers will change their website, and the link that I had last fall isn't the same link that they had this fall. So, Google is my friend. Of course, now how, often, how often do those uh, moisture sensors have to be replaced? Because I know, know they do go bad. When they stop working is a good is a good one. Uh, I think they're good for a few years for sure. The I'm trying to remember. I had a the maintenance manual the installation manual that basically tells you how to kind of maintain them with some uh, sandpaper to gently uh, sand, uh, uh, get the oxidation off of them. But um, it kind of depends on who the manufacturer is. They'll have their own procedure and how often they want to replace them. Yeah, my company uses a lot of ASE, and uh, I know I've got one that's quit working up at uh, one site in in Upper Michigan. So I'll probably end up ordering a bunch of them and uh, just uh, mass replace a few of the oldest ones. Yeah, I've opened up that the picture that I have of that one. I've opened up that one. It's pretty straightforward. Um, they were pretty good on on getting it repaired too, as well. So if you ever have to get them repaired, ASC will will turn them around pretty quick. Any other questions? Of course, now we have to figure out how to uh, avoid rain fade, uh, the rain fade at the uplinks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's where having some diverse uplinks does help. And, and if we could have, uh, find a way to avoid backhoe fade, that would be helpful too. I think that one's going to be with us to the end of time. Yeah, we had an uplink in Vernon Valley, New Jersey, which uh, got a lot of rain. Yeah, I mean, and obviously different the different bands will be impacted by rain as you know, KU band will be impacted by a little thunderstorm, CU uh, C band will uh it takes a whole lot more to uh, impact that one, but Marcus, Yeah, I mean we, we have we go ahead, sorry. I'm sorry. As long as you're talking about C band, uh, I just have to ask have you found any uh, specific issues that uh, remain after the migration or has everything settled down pretty much? Anecdotally, because I don't have any hard numbers on this, a lot of people, I think, in smaller markets figured, we're not going to get 5G, it's not going to be an issue, and never installed the 5G filters. Um, we'll get calls sometimes from some of our affiliates going, all of a sudden it's not working, and we go... Um, and we look at the logs from their receiver, and you can see that at a certain date, it started kicking on when they started turning on 5G in that market. And then we go back to them and say, did you put a filter in? Oh, no, should I? Yeah, yeah, 5G is turned on in your, in your market now, so. 
Uh, that that's really kind of the the big issue is that people who haven't put in that filter yet, thinking it'll never come to their little little town or whatever. Good warning. Good good checkpoint. Yeah. The other thing that is worth commenting on, I guess, is uh, the use of the dish covers as opposed to leaving the uh, the dish open and then sweeping the, the dust and dirt out. Yeah, I have actually have a picture of that. So this is a, a picture of, you know, one of those little covers. It mostly works. Uh, again, it depends on how much snow and ice and how wet the snow is. Uh, I know some of our dishes here, if the, the snow is nice and dry, it's not too big of an issue. But then the other day we got some really heavy wet snow and we definitely saw that impacting some of our uh, monitoring antennas. So having to get out there and get the broom out and sweep that out. But um, but these these will also work. But again, if they start loading up with ice and with snow, Uh, I think Walton even had that, what do they call it, the ice quake or the snow quake or something that was, it would basically vibrate that, um, that cover on that, on that dish. I think the bottom line really is to uh, make part of your maintenance procedure, a little checkpoint on your log, uh, checking the reading, the uh, DB reading on your receiver, to see if there's change. Uh, I know the XDS receivers have SNMP. The IDC MAP receivers have SNMP. And the EBNO values are available through that. Uh, we monitor all of our receivers with that, and we can monitor. We can see how the atmosphere is affecting the, the uplink or the downlink specifically. So you can monitor it that way as well and get those automatic alarms of, uh-oh, hey, we've started fading a little bit too much. Let's figure out why the dish heater's not melting off the snow or whatever. Very interesting. So, yeah. Any other questions about uh, dish maintenance, folks? It all seems pretty straightforward and common sense. Indeed, it, it is pretty straightforward. So let's uh, let's move on to the receivers then. And yes. This is this is where uh, 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 Karen and Mark got started with me and thought that it was important to know where things stand with these receivers. Uh, receivers, remind me. I didn't have that on my notes. XTS and the, uh, the other one? Oh, that. Let's see. I will look for, I will look for Mark's uh, note to me here. The contest. Well, that too, yes. Oh, that too. Uh, but he, he mentioned that there is an issue that, that some have been Looking at here recently, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. One of the first questions, uh, new clients, how many XDS receivers do you have access to? As far as link up, I mean, we have access to whatever the factory is making. All right. So, I mean, we're kind of just limited to... You know, how many does the, does the factory have on hand as far as quickly shipping? And then, you know, how many do you need? Are they in short supply right now? No, no, they've got plenty right now. I guess the issue, uh, again, I, I wish Mark were with us to eliminate a little further. But I guess one of the issues is that most stations want a separate receiver for each major source that they use. They don't want to be moving the 
uh, system over to different channels all day if they don't have to. Yeah, that, that comes that comes from the different networks that they're going to be affiliated with. For example, uh, with ABC, ABC News, they're their own network. They purchased the receivers, so they're basically ABC's receivers. And they generally wouldn't be sharing somebody else's content on their receivers. Um, we have another agricultural network that we distribute as well. So each of those um, networks would be providing you with a receiver. And that's kind of how we get having seven, eight in the rack. And it's like, well, I'm taking this show and I'm taking this show, but they're two different networks. So they, you know, even though it's the same satellite. Yeah. I am. And then, of course, the situation comes when you have uh, new people and uh, especially weekenders asking them to figure out how to program a receiver to mm -hmm. change channels is <laughs> that's not not a not a good go it's it's not once you do it once or twice it's like oh okay but then but trying to explain it to somebody over the phone of like okay you got to go over here you got to do this and yeah i remember that most stations wanted a receiver for each major network. Each, so each major network would basically be operating on their own, though. They could be through different providers, different satellites. Right, but uh, rather than sharing a, a receiver, uh, they'd want one for each. Yeah, again, so that the, you don't run into a situation where uh, somebody has uh, changed the channel and then your network comes up and it's dead air because it isn't there or it's still playing the other channel. Right. Well, actually, Premier um, had a store and forward system that required that you always be tuned to their network because they were feeding commercials that were mm -hmm. specific to each market. And uh, a lot of them got into trouble by using that receiver for something else. Right. So when we're doing with XDS specifically, when you're doing uh, copy splits, um, I'll take the, I'll take the Marcos O'Rourke show, you know, coming to you every weekday, blah, 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 blah. So whoever I'm doing commercials with will sell uh, commercials for me. And when I take breaks, those commercials will basically be uploaded or downloaded into that receiver to play out of that receiver. So the right. copy splits being different in each market. Right. But yes, that does need to be uh, continuously connected to the network. So that way uh, it can get those spots in, in faster than real time whenever they're sent by the traffic company. So either you or Rich just mentioned some of them have seven XDS receivers in Iraq. No, well, some have uh, more. <laughs> I yeah, so some have more, some have less. I mean, I have ten in Iraq technically, but that's because I'm monitoring different things here. But do do you get to enter the contest? No, no, the contest is explicitly uh, prohibited from. Uh, Link up employees and contractors. Well, maybe you better tell us about that contest. Well, that contest is the show us your XDS um, receiver contest. And basically you'll email Mark at link up communications, a picture of the rack uh, with your name, your call sign, location, and uh, some contact information. And you'll get entered into a weekly drawing for some X, uh, not XDS, link up swag. I'm not sure exactly what the swag is. That's that's still a mystery to me because it's Mark and Karen are doing that. I'm I'm over here. Uh, but it is some whatever the the cool link up swag is going to be, and then every month it'll be a a drawing for a $200 gift card, and then at the end of the contest it'll be a 
everybody who entered will be entered into the $500 gift card. And it'll run from February 21st, which was yesterday, through May 1st. And then there's all the contest information and rules on our website at linkupcommunications.com slash contest. So I guess I should say it for official rules and blah, 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 you know. <laughs> so everyone here today is on the ground floor. They got first shot. Absolutely. I think we've already had one person already send stuff in, but, you know, you'll, you'll still be in for the uh, next week's drawing and the, the drawing at the end of the month. So, and then obviously for the grand prize one as well. But only if, one entry per person per call letters per week. So, if I don't have a station, can I uh, send you a photo of a, a promo photo? And <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it has to be your station because that's part of the the entry is your name, your call sign, and location. Hand drawn pictures not acceptable. <laughs> Hand drawn pictures, no, no. Hey, Marcus. Yes. Um, can I ask you an XDS question? Sure. Okay. I have a high school that is taking in, uh, uh, that is supposed to be taking in from uh, news from X, uh, from an XDS receiver. And sure enough, the school's firewall system is blocking all communication. And I've been tr fighting like crazy, trying to find out what ports have to be opened. Would you know what ports have to be open that the uh, XDS will receive? Yes. Hang on a second. Let me. Did I get too in the weeds right now with that question? <laughs> <laughs> I do have that relative. I think I have that. Uh, are they taking it by streaming or by satellite? By, stream by streaming. Uh. 20 to 21 for FTP, 53 for DNS, 80 for HTTP, uh, 123 for NTP, and 443 for HTTPS. Pretty pretty standard ports. Yeah, I, I just went through this fight this morning. Um, so you said 20 through 21, 54, 80, 123, and 443? 20, 21, 53, 80, 123, 443. Okay, 53, not 54. Okay. Yeah, for DNS. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Are they going to be entering the contest? If I can get it working, I promise you I will answer. <laughs> Marcus, I had a question. Have uh, all the conflicts with the big airports and the airlines that couldn't uh, allow this have been resolved? Allow the... Allow implementation of take for their altimeters. I think Delta and United were pushing back and not allowing those sites to come up near some major airports. For oh, uh, for C band, I I don't know. I don't know if that's all been resolved yet. I have not been paying attention to, to that the, part. But the fix was in in the avionics, so, which amazed me that some were older than others. But uh, it hasn't been it hasn't been on the nightly news for quite a while. But it was. I mean, they were the sky is falling, or the airplane right. Is falling, so it was quite something. Right. I I did see some. Um, information about about those all those radar altimeters they have no filtering at all so anything that's even remotely nearby would probably cause some issues so yeah i, I believe the issue was getting those replaced but the last i saw was that the faa was having to do their their part of of getting people to update their altimeters that's correct on the aircraft. They were like seven right. sevens or something, the older ones. But I believe they they needed like six months, and that was a year ago. So it should be all clear by then. Right. Yeah. Hopefully. As I recall, the airlines fought that. Oh yeah. Well, oh yeah. Probably a couple million dollars that they wouldn't have had to do otherwise. So, but uh, that's part that's part of the uh, 
the unfunded the mandate. <laughs> I think it was some, you know, like JFK and SFO and uh, some big airports. I believe that's all been worked out. Well, we haven't had planes crashing lately, so that that's good. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, you've had doors blow out, but you haven't had planes crashing. I, I hear this uh, bomb threat in a, in a bathroom mirror uh, was solely on the shoulders of the uh, Boeing factory. Wow. That's tongue-in-cheek, guys. Everything, <laughs> anything that goes down now is a Boeing problem. Got it. That's uh, why Mark is hiding inside his television. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jeff Fairburn, he had a a pita bread fade on his satellite dish. Crows would scavenge bread from discarded takeaway kebabs and stuff in the feed horns and put it in there. <laughs> <laughs> that's one I have never heard of. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, that's why the plastic owls are put everywhere in a teleport. Same Same problem, right? Mm -hmm. Had uh, squirrel stuff and stuff in there, and wasps, and you name it. I have run into my fair share of wasps here. That's been fun. Yeah, you know, the plastic ospreys or, or owls seemed to work for a while, but then the then they got they got wise and said, "Oh, that's just a little piece of plastic." Yeah, well, we fortunately have a couple of uh, hawks that live in the trees right off to the uh, west of us. So they, they kind of help keep birds away from our uh, dishes and stuff. Rich Hahn has a thought here, uh, going back to centering the, uh, the dish, he mentions he thought it was a good idea to pull the null signals from the adjacent satellites as well as peaking the one that you're looking for. Sometimes that's a uh, balance, is it? It, I guess it depends on what satellite you're doing and what dish you have. Um, I mean, if you're peaked on the signal of what you're trying to receive, you're not going to be on adjacent satellites. But again, if you have a, a dish that's uh, not two degree compliant, you might be getting some spill from the adjacent satellites. You mean there are people out there running whole dishes? I have seen things. <laughs> yeah. Usually well, smaller markets, but yes, I have seen some interesting installations. I've received some calls here saying, hey, we're having some interference. We know where our thing is. Oh, well, going down the troubleshooting steps. Send me a picture of your, of your dish. Oh, that's... Uh, how long have you had that up there for? Oh, <laughs> gosh, a uh, long time. All right, well. <laughs> Just like with the EAS boxes that somehow they didn't get updated four years ago and been receiving alerts. Yeah, yeah. Dish is a dish is a dish is a dish, so they see no reason to fix that. Uh, yeah, I mean, even with the, the, the 5G filter issue that I had mentioned earlier. Well, it hasn't been an issue so far here. And then all of a sudden Verizon or whoever flips on 5G and. Yeah. And I'm sure there are more than a few that took the money from the commission and then didn't do anything. Yeah. Or they went on vacation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I mean, Fortunately, I mean, you can still get 5G filters relatively easily, so. Now, let's take just a moment here. Uh, LinkedIn purchased the uh, Orbital Media, which had purchased the Good old channel. National Supervisory Network. Yeah, it was, uh, we bought Orbital, which bought Clear Channel Satellite, which bought uh, NSN. So... So you're running how many networks do you know offhand? Uh, out of here? Yes. Offhand? No, I don't. Okay. 
Mark would know, but maybe if he's listening, he'll he'll come in and hoarsely tell us. Yeah, we we definitely have several networks and and more coming on board. You know, all the time we're just onboarded another one a couple of weeks ago. So, well, I know that LinkedIn specializes in putting small networks together and regional and state networks, things like that. Was that dish pointing at the trees? Yeah, who shared that? That was. Well, that I guess was... also that's another thing to add to the maintenance is make sure the vegetation in front of the dish is. Uh... Oh yeah. That is in Plattsburgh, New York, and it's not an active dish, but I just think they were too lazy to remove it, but there's no signal because it's pointed directly into the trees. <laughs> we used to have that trouble with STLs, didn't we? Mm -hmm. There's an old adage about microwave path planning, which that is, and playing golf, is that you think, uh, you think the tree's not there until you try to do either one. <laughs> <laughs> Send a signal through it. Well, Marcus, I sure appreciate the information that you've uh, brought us. And certainly, I learned a few things. And I hope some of our friends have also learned a few things that maybe they didn't know about uh, picking their dish. And uh, certainly, the, the contest ought to be new to most people since it just started yesterday. It just started yesterday. So that's all good. So I appreciate that.